In my experience, we often want to use this story to praise Mary, to see in it how humble, how faithful, how obedient she is. Rebecca Crow shared this week that she once asked a Roman Catholic priest why the Catholic Church is so fond of Mary, and his response was something along the lines of, well, God thought she was pretty amazing, so don't you think that's worth something? In reality, I think the whole point of this story is that Mary is utterly unremarkable. She's the polar opposite of Mary Poppins. She's absolutely average in every way. God could have chosen anyone. In fact, God did choose anyone. That's how Mary got the job in the first place. God wasn't looking for someone with power or privilege or wealth, but an average, ordinary person. How many other young women just like her were living in Galilee at that time? Dozens? Hundreds? Thousands? And sure, Joseph is a uh, descendant of King David, but at 14 generations removed, how many shirt-tail relatives must he have had? Other heirs to David's line. To turn this story into a praise of Mary misses the point entirely. But one thing that is remarkable about Mary is her response to the angel's message. She doesn't consider what this is going to cost her and say no, but neither does she say yes. She doesn't think about the great privilege that will come with being the mother to God's son and greedily accept this, counting whatever cost as worthwhile. Instead, all she says is, it is what it is. Let it be with me according to your word. You might hear resignation in this, or maybe you hear acceptance, but I hear something else. I hear trust. I hear a hope in something that is larger than herself. You see, Mary knows better than anyone that she is not worthy to be the mother of the Messiah. She knows that she's nothing special. And because she knows this, she knows that God is not doing this for her. Not because she deserves it, not because she needs it, not because she wants it. She knows that this is not about her at all, that she is incidental to this equation. She knows that God will do this with or without her. And that means that God is doing this for the world. That is what she trusts. Not that this will bless her, but that this will bless everyone. Last week, I shared with you what Thomas Merton wrote about the point of nothingness that exists at the center of each of us. He says, This little point of nothingness and of absolute poverty is the pure glory of God in us. It is, so to speak, God's name written in us as our poverty, as our indigence, as our dependence, as our birthright. Now, poverty and indigence and dependence don't sound like good qualities, but Merton says they're not only good, they're gifts. They're our inheritance from God. To recognize them as such helps us to know that we have nothing that God needs. We have nothing to bring to the table. Unlike King David, we know that God doesn't need us. And that can only mean that God wants us, that God chooses us. All the things that we call gifts, all our talents and skills and resources and right actions and good deeds and good intentions, all of it are not ours. They all come from God. God made David who he was, brought him up from tending sheep to lead a nation. And so it's actually comical for David then to look at God in pity and believe that God needs him to provide a house. But it's just as comical and just as tragically misguided for us to believe that it's our good actions that God needs. For us to believe that God needs us to donate what we have to God's cause. Because all that we have has been given to us by God in the first place. It's all already at God's disposal. 
which can only mean that God has disposed of it by giving it to us. Like Mary, we have somehow found ourselves unexpectedly in favor with God, completely irrespective of who we are or what we've done. To understand and embrace this is to admit that we are nothing, that we have nothing, that we can do nothing, that God has done everything, that we have received, in the words of St. John, grace upon grace. Now, since these things already belong to God, it means that God has blessed us with them for the same reason that God blessed Mary with a surprise pregnancy, to bring forth God's love into the world. Because these gifts belong to God and not to us, we never have to worry about running out of them, because they come from the one true source, the fountain of living water which never runs dry. Now that's a much different attitude than most of us have about ourselves and our things, isn't it? Most of the time we're worried about not having enough, about spreading ourselves too thin or overcommitting ourselves. We spend so much time and energy trying to protect ourselves and our resources, trying to fill ourselves up and make sure we don't run out of time or money or energy. I know this is true because this is my story. Prior to my sabbatical, I was utterly spent. I had nothing left to give. I'd given too much, said yes too often, and I had nothing left over for myself. Over the summer, I took time for me, and I remembered the importance of caring for myself, of keeping my boundaries secure so I could always have enough to share. And that's a good thing to remember. Since I've been back, I've been very intentional about those boundaries, about saying no more, about not overcommitting myself. And you know what? I've been experiencing the same emptiness as before. I have plenty in reserve, but I've not been around when people need me. I've been selfish about my time. I've not felt more connected, any more connected to God than before I left. I actually cried last week during the confession as I realized this. The recognition that I've been failing to do the one thing that I want more than anything else, to love as I have been loved, brought me to tears. My problem, our problem, is that we think dualistically in terms of me or you. I can serve one or the other, but not both. But like I said last week, me and you are illusions. They're constructed identities that we use to make sense of the world. The one true reality is there is no me any more than there is a you, that there is only the light, which is the life of all creation, the pure glory of God that shines within all of us. When I, when I try too hard to serve you, I become an enabler. I run myself dry. When I try too hard to serve me, I become selfish and I've got nothing to share. Either way, I cut myself off from the one true source because I'm trying too hard to control what I'm doing. I'm holding too tightly onto how much I'm loving or how I am serving or how if I am doing it right. To really love is not to serve myself or yourself, but the one true self, the self of which we are all a part. It's to let go of the illusion that you or I are not branches of the same vine or sandcastles made from the same sand. This is perhaps what Mary comes to understand in the presence of the angel, that this pregnancy isn't her blessing, nor is it a blessing that belongs just to others. It's God's blessing for all of us together. And so she lets go of her worries her needs, her sufferings, and lets the glory of God fill her, lets the power of the Spirit overshadow her, and all humanity is blessed. When we believe that Jesus 
has come here to offer us some divine evacuation plan to help us escape the clutches of sin and death. We reduce God's good news to what Jesus can do for me personally. It makes Jesus' birth all about me, about giving into the illusion of myself as separate from the light that shines in the darkness. What if? What if instead of believing that Christ came to fulfill each of us separately, we begin to trust that we are here to fulfill Christ? To serve the light that shines within all of us. That the true light shining in us really does intend to enlighten all people, all creation. To engage in that trust means letting go like Mary and trusting in a reality and a hope that we cannot yet perceive. This kind of letting go is not for the faint of heart, but it is God's invitation for all of us. When Mary lets go and empties herself, not for her own sake, mind you, and not for the sake of others, but for the sake of of what God has called her to do, then she finds that the way up is down. That when she empties herself, God then becomes her fullness. Merton calls that point of nothingness the Pont Vierge, the blank point or the virgin point, the point which, in his words, is untouched by sin and illusion, point or a spark which belongs entirely to God, which is inaccessible to the fantasies of our own mind or the brutalities of our own will. If we can learn to embrace that Pointe Vierge, to admit our absolute poverty, our poverty even of self, to let go of that illusion that I am separate from you, separate from everyone else in the world, then the divine love somehow becomes incarnate in us. Not by our power, not because we are worthy, but only by God's spirit. I'm still figuring out what that means, what that looks like, how to live that in my life, how to even understand that fully. But I trust that it's true. That's what it is for us to wait for God's kingdom, I think. To wait, to watch, to hope, to wrestle, to let go. Always knowing that Christ is coming, with or without us. That we have been invited to bear this divine love in our own flesh. To shine with the light of Christ in the darkness.